girl. All right. Good morning and welcome to our oversight hearing on women aging into poverty in New York City. I am Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee, and we are joined here today by the Committee on Aging, chaired by Councilmember Margaret Chin. As Chair of the Committee on Women, I've held a number of hearings that highlight the impact on gender imbalance and discrimination, uh, that the impact of, um, sorry, gender imbalance and discrimination have on women, especially women of color and women who identify as LGBTQ+. At today's hearing, we will discuss how, it, hang on one second, my apologies. At today's hearing, we will discuss how the status quo fails women throughout their lives and how this contributes to a large and growing number of older women aging into poverty in New York City. Older adults are the fastest growing segment of New York City's population, and women significantly outnumber men in this age cohort, comprising 60% of adults over 65. As women age, Decades of pay inequity, uncompensated and unrecognized work as caregivers, comparatively higher health care and transportation costs, as well as myriad of other factors contribute to their increased risk of poverty. As such, we see a higher percentage of older women who are impoverished as compared to men. Over the course of their lifetimes, women will earn, uh, if they are women of color, around 70 cents for every dollar. Um, and let's split that down. If uh, so Latinas are earning around, uh, I think it's now 60 cents, 54 or 60 cents on every dollar, and black women, it's closer to 70 cents on every dollar for eight for uh, white women, it's 80 cents for every dollar that their male counterparts earn. This gender and racial-based earning inequity compounds over time. In addition to employment challenges, women are often called upon to be caregivers for both children and for older relatives, which affects their ability to make ends meet, save for retirement, and can and can present insurmountable barriers to a competitive career trajectory. While women on the whole earn and save less than their male counterparts, they also face additional costs. For instance, women in New York City can spend up to $1,200 more than men on transportation per year if they are their fam family's main caregiver caregiver, and Sarah Kaufman at NYU did groundbreaking research um, to verify this. Compounding matters navigating public transit when elderly or disabled is profoundly difficult in our largely inaccessible subway system, and access ride is plagued by delays, inefficiencies, and concerns about length language access for the city's considerable senior immigrant population. Women are also impacted by higher health care costs. Over the course of their lives, women will spend 33% more on health care than men, yet older women in New York City are less likely than men to receive treatments for renal and cardiac treatments. Not unlike many New Yorkers, older women struggle to secure affordable and safe housing. Women comprise the majority of severely rent burdened households not receiving any form of housing assistance and as a result, more women are experiencing homelessness for the first time as older adults. The city is beginning to address these challenges, but a comprehensive assessment of the needs of our growing population of older women is urgently required. 
To begin, accessibility must be improved. The stock of affordable senior housing must be increased. And caregivers need to be made whole for their loss of income. We also need clarity from the administration about how their recent health care proposal will affect seniors and senior women in particular. I look forward to hearing testimony from the administration and stakeholders on proposals to, ad to address this critical issue and arriving at a collaborative and long-term vision to help improve conditions for older women in New York City. I want to thank Ned Terrace, my legislative director, as well as committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Brenda McKinney, who is my general counsel, Chloe Rivera, our legislative policy analyst who wrote a tremendous report I encourage everyone to read for details, and Monica People, our finance analyst. Um, and I'd like to welcome council members Ayea, uh, Kalos and Lander uh, from the Committee on Women for joining us today. And I must say that um, I am uh, currently asked to be in two other meetings at the current time. And so I may step out now and then and want to thank my uh, co-chair, Council Member Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, for um, her work. And I'm going to turn it over to her now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Councilmember Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you for joining us today's uh, joint hearing on, with the Committee on Women on Women Aging into Poverty. I want to thank Chair Helen Rosenthal for co-chairing this hearing today. During almost every aging committee hearing, I share the undeniable fact that New York City is growing older. From 2005 to 2015, the population of older adults, older than 65 in New York City, increased from 947,000 to 1.13 million, a nearly 20% growth. While this is a fact to be celebrated, unfortunately, as our older adult population increases, so do the number of older adults aging into poverty. Across the city, our older adults are struggling to pay their rent, pay for their health care, and pay for other things they need to properly age in place. While older adults of both gender struggle financially, research showed that older women are struggling more than older men. According to studies compared to their male counterpart, older women retire earlier, face more instances of age discrimination in the workplace, retire with less in their retirement savings, and earn less Social Security income due to the gender gap in the workforce. It is no surprise, then, that older women also struggle more to secure affordable and safe housing on their limited fixed income. In fact, study shows that regardless of educational background, race, or marital status, women over the age of 65 are more likely to be living below the poverty line than men. New York City's older women experience poverty at a rate of 6.3% higher than older men do. The sad reality is that one out of five New York women are living in poverty. And the barriers leading to this disparity are even more challenging for women in vulnerable groups, such as women of color, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer women, and immigrant women. In general, women in these populations are even more likely to live in poverty and receive less social support services than their male counterpart. Older adults are not only our present, they are our future. They offer valuable contribution to the workplace and society. We cannot leave our older adults to struggle financially. We cannot leave our older women without support. 60% of our city's older adult population are women. And far too long, older adult women have been left out of the conversation about women. 
we must ensure that this vulnerable group is also included in conversations about gender equity. Following up on our age discrimination hearing from September 2018, I'm proud to sponsor resolution number 714, which calls on the United States Congress to reintroduce and for the president to sign the Protecting Older Workers Against Discrimination Act. This act, introduced by U.S. Senator Robert P. Casey Jr. and Congressman Robert Scott in 2017, would reverse the Supreme Court's decision in Gross v. FBL Financial Services, Inc. In that case, the Supreme Court took away protection for older Americans by making it more difficult to prove an age discrimination claim. Mm. This resolution, the Protecting Older Worker Against Discrimination Act, would reinstate mixed motive claims, allowing employees to pursue an age discrimination claim even if age discrimination is not the only factor in their claim. Helping counteract age discrimination in the workplace is only one way in which we can help our older adult population. Working with the Department for the Aging, we must do more and do better to make sure our older adults and especially our older women are getting the financial support they need to survive and age with dignity. Let's not forget, aging isn't a one-dimensional issue. It's a woman's issue, a health access issue, economic equality issue, and a justice issue. Comprehensive issues require comprehensive policy and solution. At this hearing, we hope to hear more from the Department of the Aging and the administration about what resources are available for older women, what patterns, if any, they have found in this population, and what more we can do as a city to help older women. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing, our counsel, Nusat Todari, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, Johini Supura, and my legislative director, Mirren Gira. And I'd like to also um, thank the members of the Committee on Aging who have joined us earlier, Council Member Valong, Council Member Deutsch, Council Member Diaz, Council Member Ayala, and Council Member Drum. Uh, I was told that there is a budget negotiation hearing meeting going on, so they have to step out and some of them will come back. And I will now turn the floor back to my co-chair, Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask my general counsel to administer the oath. Oh, sorry. I'd like to welcome to the panel uh, Jackie Ebanks, Executive Director of the Commission on Gender Equity, and Karen Resnick, Acting Commissioner for DIFTA, who, both of whom we've worked with for a long time and really appreciate all your work that you do on behalf of women and on behalf of older adults. I'd like to ask my general counsel to administer the oath. You can please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member questions today? I do. I do. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, committee chairs, Chen and Rosenthal, and members of the Committee on Aging and the Committee on Women. I am Jacqueline Ebanks, Executive Director of the Com City's Commission on Gender Equity. In this role, I also serve as an advisor to the mayor and first lady on policies and issues impacting gender equity in New York City. I'm pleased today to join Deputy Commissioner Resnick and at the Department of Aging to provide testimony on this critical issue of women aging into poverty. As you know, the Commission on Gender Equity works with city agencies to develop and implement gender equitable policies and practices in three areas of focus, economic mobility and opportunity, health and reproductive justice, and safety. 
To successfully carry out our responsibilities, CGE recognizes the diversity of gender, including gender identity and expression. CGE also operates with an intersectional lens. This means that the Commission's population of focus are girls, women, transgender, and gender nonconforming individuals, regardless of ability, age, ethnicity or race, faith, gender expression, immigrant status, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. And finally, CGE ensures that the city leads in the development and implementation of best practices in gender equitable policies and programs for both its workforce and its residents. This hearing today calls for us to consider, at a minimum, the intersection of gender and age. My testimony today will describe how the Commission on Gender Equity will carry out its work at this critical intersection. To begin, I call your attention to the Commission's strategic plan, which highlights the intersection when it commits to defining and closing the gender asset and gender wealth gap as one of our key strategies in the Commission's economic mobility and opportunity focus area. The Commission will work to define and close the gender and asset gap and wealth gap by examining the role of caregiving, be it paid or unpaid, the role that caregiving plays in disconnecting women from the workforce or keeping them in low-wage jobs and careers. As a result, upon retirement, women increasingly find themselves in poverty because they have no or low retirement incomes on which to live. That is why the Commission on Gender Equity applauds the mayor's announcement in his State of the City address that the city will establish retirement plans for any worker who doesn't have one. These retirement plans will fill a gap for employees, regardless of gender identity or gender expression. They will ensure that all employees have a resource with which they can build a secure retirement. In the Commission's health and reproductive justice focus area, the strategic plan calls for ensuring the affordability and availability of comprehensive, culturally competent medical care for New Yorkers, regardless of their gender identity or gender expression. With an adequate retirement income, supports for health care costs will be a significant challenge for aging individuals, particularly women who, know lo who live longer than their male counterparts. The connection between health care costs and poverty among aging individuals, particularly women, cannot be ignored or overstated. And so the Commission will work with the appropriate city agencies to amplify existing supports, ones that are currently being provided to aging individuals, and also work to identify additional resources that can provide our senior citizens with greater opportunities for healthy aging. Finally, in the Commission's safety focus area, we envision a city free from gender and race-based violence. To that end, the Commission will work with city agencies to ensure safe environments for persons of all gender identities and gender expressions, whether it be in public and or private spaces. This commitment is critically important for the aging population, again, particularly for women, transgender, and gender nonconforming individuals who experience gender-based violence at higher rates than their male counterparts and become increasingly vulnerable as they age. In closing, I'd like to thank you again for this opportunity to share the commi Commission's plans as they impact aging women and gender nonconforming individuals. I look forward to working with the City Council to advance gender equity in the city. And with that, it is my honor to introduce Karen Resnick, Acting Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the Department of Aging. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, Chairperson Chin, Rosenthal, and members of the Committees on Aging and Committee on Women. I am Karen Resnick, Acting Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner of External Affairs for the New York City Department for the Aging. And thank you to Jackie E. Banks and for her wonderful testimony. Some of the highest rates in New York City, of poverty rates in New York City, are among older women. 
In addition, according to the Summary of Vital Statistics 2016, published by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, life expectancy among female New Yorkers is 83 and a half years, while life expectancy among male New Yorkers is 78.5 years of age. The older the population, the more likely they are to be in poverty. In New York City, 20% or one in five women age 65 and older live below the federal poverty line, which is 4% greater than the rate of men age 65 and older. Nationally, near, nearly 11% of women age 65 and older live below the poverty line, which is about 3% higher than that of men. Poverty increases with age, 18% of women aged 60 to 64 in New York City live in poverty, which grows to more than 20% of women aged 75 and older. In relation to race and ethnicity, poverty rates of older women of color in New York City are higher than the rate for older white women. Immigration status and years living in the U.S. also have an impact on poverty levels. Compared to U.S. born women in New York City, Poverty rates increase from more than one in 10 to about one in five for older immigrant women. Older female New Yorkers living alone also have nearly triple the poverty rate than those living with others. Related to increased life expectancy, approximately 30% of older women in New York City report challenges with mobility and self-care. In light of this data, I will discuss various DIFTA programs that target the needs of older New Yorkers, including the most vulnerable and frail, the majority of whom are older women. Given the fact that female New Yorkers have a longer life expectancy than their male counterparts, unsurprisingly, the majority of seniors who participate in DIFTA-sponsored programs are, in fact, women. Approximately 70% of senior center attendees naturally occurring retirement communities, program participants, and case management clients are women. Women comprise more than 60% of home delivered meal recipients, and as expected given their longer life expectancy, most home care clients are women. About 80% of housekeeper and chore service clients and homemaking personal care clients are women. In terms of other services, women comprise approximately 80% of our transportation clients and nearly 70% of case assistance recipients and nutrition education participants. DIFTA currently funds senior centers at 249 sites across the five boroughs. Senior centers provide meals at no cost to seniors, though modest contributions are accepted and are completely voluntary, and in an environment where older New Yorkers can participate in a variety of recreational, health promotional, and cultural activities, as well as receive counseling on social services and obtain assistance with benefits. In fiscal year 18, approximately 173,000 older New Yorkers attended senior center programs, and each day, more than 23,000 older adults received meals at senior centers, and more than 29,000 participated in activities without taking a meal. As part of Thrive New York City, the DIFTA Geriatric Mental Health Initiative provides mental health services on site at 25 of the largest senior centers in the agency's network citywide. Mental health professionals assist senior center members with issues ranging from depression and anxiety to highly disruptive behaviors. DGMH sites include the Mott Street Senior Center and the Weinberg Center for Balanced Living, both located in Chairperson's Din Chins District, the Project Fine Hamilton Senior Center in Chairperson Rosenthal's District, and the Center at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House in Councilmember Kalos's District, and Jay Harama Senior Center in Councilman Deutsch's District, and the Coney Island Seaside Innovative Senior Center in Councilman Traeger's District. Individuals do not need to be a senior center member, but must be 60 years of age or older to receive mental health services on site at these locations. Similar to the percentage of female senior center members, more than 70% of our geriatric mental health participants are women. According to a recent Fordham University study commissioned by DIFTA, which followed older adults who attended senior centers and older adults who did not, 
The older adult population served by senior centers are among those with the lowest incomes, the fewest resources, the poorest health, the greatest social isolation, and the most need for services. The findings of this study indicate that senior centers are attracting this group that has multiple needs, and senior center members experience improved physical and mental health, not only in the time period after joining a senior center, but maintain or even continue to improve even one year later. This is a very important finding, given the decline in health and social activity in this age group, especially among those with low incomes, and considering that seven out of 10 senior center members are women. The department funds 28 naturally occurring retirement communities, or NORCs, which are residential locations that are neither age restricted nor built exclusively for seniors. Over time, however, they've become home to significant concentrations of older residents. These communities are located in public housing, low to moderate income co-ops, co -ops, and low to moderate income private rentals. There are five primary objectives for DIFTA funded NORC programs. All NORC programs should provide supportive environments that allow seniors' independence as they age in place, engage residents and facilitate linkages within the community, assess the needs of senior residents, and offer supportive services based on assessments, and build strong and meaningful communities that cultivate new roles for community members. The NORC programs provide services such as case management for homebound and non-homebound seniors, assistance with accessing public benefits, and an increased emphasis on wellness, chronic disease risk assessments, and healthcare management. In fiscal year 18, NORC programs serve more than 16,000 older New York residents, and of those residents, more than 11,000 are older women. These supportive service programs have been integral to their ability to age in place. DIFTA's case management system provides a comprehensive approach to allow older New Yorkers to continue to live at home and be engaged in their communities. Case management assess assessments identify the strengths and needs of older adults, and case managers work with clients to plan how to meet their needs and to coordinate services and resources on their behalf. The two primary services offered through case management are home-delivered meals and home care. The goal of both services is to help clients achieve the greatest level of comfort in the friendly and familiar environment of his or her own home for as long as possible. Home delivered meals help vulnerable older New Yorkers who are homebound and unable to prepare meals maintain or improve their nutritional health. All meals meet federal and city dietary standards, and in FY18, 4.6 million meals were delivered to seniors in their homes. Home care services include home banking, personal care, a service for functionally impaired older persons who need assistance with personal care needs, and housekeeper chore, a service for functionally impaired older persons who need assistance with housekeeping. Nearly 1.2 million hours of home care services were provided to more than 3,600 recipients in fiscal year 18. For the more than 14,000 older women who are case management clients, home delivered meals and home care are vital services. The Friendly Visiting Program, also a Thrive New York City initiative, fo focuses on isolated, largely homebound seniors who are served through DIFTA's 21 ca contracted case management programs, which cover all 59 community districts. The program was designed to connect seniors facing the negative effects of social isolation with well-trained volunteers who spend time with them in order to provide social interaction. As a result, Friendly Visiting serves as a mental health intervention program. The program model expands the older adult's connection to their community and may prevent the isolated senior from declining into depression and loneliness. The program coordinators recruit friendly visitors who are matched with a homebound older adult. Friendly visitors then visit the senior at least, at least two times per month. And any changes in functioning, including identified mental health issues, are referred to the case management agency for appropriate referrals and follow-up. Since the program's inception, volunteers have made more than 32,000 visits to older adults in their homes and have spent almost 48,000 hours with seniors. Comparable to the percentage of case management clients who are women, about 75% of adults receiving visits are women. 
Women comprise 66% of caregivers in the U.S. and are two and a half times more likely than non-caregivers to live in poverty, coping with the combined pressures of caring for a loved one, their need for income, reliance on public, public assistance, and fewer employment-related benefits. DIFTA has contracted with community-based organizations citywide since 2001 to provide services under the National Family Caregiver Support Program. The 10 caregiver programs funded by DIFTA have served approx approximately 5,800 individuals throughout the city in FY18, providing information about caregiving, discussing the associated stressors, and offering pertinent resources such as respite and supplemental services. Also available for caregivers through these programs is supportive counseling, support groups, and training. Seven of the 10 DIFTA-sponsored caregiver programs serve designated catchment areas. Of these seven programs, three serve grandparents raising grandchildren, in addition to working with adult, child, and spousal caregivers. The remaining three programs assist caregivers citywide. One program serves Chinese, Japanese, and Korean caregivers, another program serves the blind and visually impaired, and the third program serves the LGBT caregiving community. Caregiver assistance is also available through DIFTA's Caregiver Resource Center. In fiscal year 18, more than 4,200 individuals received information and referral regarding residential alternatives, long-term care services and supports, and appropriate community services. Case consultation is provided to other professionals seeking services as well. Corresponding to the national data regarding the percentage of women who are family caregivers, almost 70% of caregivers served through the department programs are women. In the United States, 2.7 million grandparents serve as the primary caregiver for their grandchildren. One-fifth or 22% of grandparent caregivers living below the federal poverty line while 10% among the general population of individuals aged 50 and older are below the federal poverty line. In New York City, about 66,000 grandparents are raising grandchildren under 18, while 70% of children raised solely by two grandparents live in poverty. That rate increases to almost 50% for children living with just one grandparent, usually the grandmother. The Grandparent Resource Center, the first of its kind in the nation was established by the department in 1994. The GRC provides a number of supportive services to those older adults who are raising grandchildren and other young relatives. Resource specialists at the GRC offer advocacy and case assistance, as well as referrals to appropriate community-based organizations. These CBOs provide services such as preventive services, legal services, financial assistance, advocacy, educational services, tutoring services for children, family counseling, and support groups. In order to serve some of the neediest kinship caregiver families, the GRC program expanded under the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety. As part of MAP, the MAP initiative, GRC community advocates work with residents at 15 New York City Housing Authority developments and provide resources and services to grandparent caregivers. Through the initiative, grandparent and relative caregivers has received grandparent education, community safety trainings, intergenerational programming, and peer support on raising grandchildren. The vast majority, 85% of grandparents served through the GRC are women. Through the Senior Center Community Service Employment Program, also known as Title V, DIFTA has provided older adults with job training, linkages to employment, and opportunities to share their talents and experience with their communities. The work of CSEP remains critically important because older New Yorkers, especially women, are living longer than ever before, and many turn to DIFTA for help to secure a continuing role in the workforce. Federal funding available under Title V of the Older Americans Act is the major national resource for workforce development services for older adults. DIFTA is one of the largest recipients of Title V funding in the nation. CSEP is funded by the United States Department of Labor and is overseen in part by the National Council on Aging, as well as by the New York State Office for the Aging. <clears throat> this program is DIFTA's primary initiative to assist older New Yorkers specifically in need of employment. 
Programs supported by Title V funding must be age spe specific and means tested. Consequently, DIFTA-CISA programs serve New Yorkers age 55 and older with low to moderate incomes. <clears throat> CSEP combines classroom and job training opportunities with placement services. Job readiness preparation is an essential part of the training curriculum. Workshops are offered to hone skills for job searching and job retention and include resume preparation, cover letter writing, and interviewing. High school equivalency, diploma, and English for speakers of other languages classes are offered as well. Many individuals also benefit from on-the-job training. Upon completion of classroom <clears throat> and on-the-job training, DIFTA works to place Title V participants into unsubsidized permanent employment. Top industries for placement of Title V include healthcare, administration, administrative support, security, service, maintenance, and education. In FY18, CSEP served approximately 440 individuals, including more than 300 women. More than 50% of participants were placed into unsubsidized employment. Success of the Title V program is not demonstrated simply by job placement. Employment retention is another important measure and one in which DIFTA-sponsored participants have excelled. About 95% of participants in FY18 retain their jobs in the two quarters following their exits from the program. <clears throat> DIFTA offers programs and services that are available citywide <clears throat> to address the unique needs of older adults and to help optimize seniors' health, well-being, and ability to live independently at home. In light of the poverty and life expectancy data, women are the majority of participants in DIFTA programs. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify today, and I'm pleased to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for um, your comprehensive testimony, <laughs> reviewing what all the services DIFTA <coughs> offer. And since we're starting the budget uh, process, um, don't you think a lot of them should be funded more <laughs> and expanded, right? That's what we're going to be really focusing. Um, I wanted to uh, start with a couple of questions and then I'll pass it on uh, to my colleagues if they uh, have questions. Uh, I know in the, in, uh, Acting Commissioner, in your testimony, I was um, focusing when you were talking about um, all the programming, you know, the case management, the home, home care services, unfortunately, those are the program that has a constant wait list. And that's something that we've been working with the administration uh, to eliminate wait lists, that seniors should not be on any kind of waiting list. Uh, do you have any figure right now in terms of how many seniors are on waiting lists for home care services and case management? Um, the most recent figures I looked at that were reported this year, actually, to the State Office for the Aging, and you know we, we discuss this at uh, every hearing, they are point in time, and so this number fluctuates up and down as people come on and off of the programs. Our wait list is almost um, eliminated for home care. I think at the point in time numbers I looked at, it was about 100 clients, um, and case management is a, around 1,000. And I just learned today, actually, coming here this morning, that the State Office for the Aging was successful in getting $15 million for the state, um, of which DIFTA will get a share based on the numbers that we've reported for wait lists. So they, too, are looking to eliminate wait lists for both home care and through the ICEP program on a statewide level. I mean, that's good news, uh, because in order for uh, an older adult to qualify for home care service, they first has to go through case management. And if there's a case management wait list, they gotta wait for home care service. I mean, the only program uh, that an older adult can get right away is a home delivered meal, right? That's correct. So I know that in my office, we have assisted a couple of seniors who are not on Medicaid, 
um, and they were ha very happy that they were able to access home care services, but still it took a couple of months for them to get that service. Uh, so I think the, the wait list, I mean, usually when a senior asks for help, they need help months ago. So we have to figure a way um, to cut down the time so when they apply, they can get the help as quickly uh, as possible. And then also my other question is on the caregiver uh, funding. Because um, I know right now you have 10 program and three are citywide. And there is an RFP that's going to out, go out. And I heard, you, correct me, uh, within the RFP that you're going to cut back on the citywide service from three to two? Uh, no, actually we issued an addendum to that RFP. So there actually is an, in, there will be three citywide programs and we increased uh, the geography. So there's an additional program in Manhattan. Okay, so the, there's, there's no cutback for the citywide no. services. Now that was one of the program that we were able uh, to get the administration to baseline in our year of the senior um, rally cry for more funding. Uh, are you looking at advocating for an increase? Because that was only four million. And yes, we're happy that, that it's baseline, but right, it needs the four to go million up. is baselined, um, and it's included obviously the funding in our new RFP, and we were able to add a little more funding. So the total funding. Um, for those 11 providers overall is up this year. So we're very pleased about that. So have you put in a request to OMB to increase that funding? No, I don't believe that we have. That's not good. But how do you think we're going to get an increase if they, don't, if they don't hear directly from us? So whoever's sitting there representing the administration, you heard it here. I want to see something in the preliminary budget, which we're getting very soon. Um, Director Ebanks, um, thank you for your testimony and thank you for being here. Now, in the mayor's uh, state of the city, he talked about uh, the healthcare for all program. So I wanted to see how, uh, what role would uh, your commission be able to play to make sure that older women, uh, older adults will be able to take advantage uh, of that program, and same thing for uh, the retirement right. uh, benefit. I mean, those are the two new programs that the mayor had talked about, and we want to make sure that the older adults do not get left out uh, in these programs. Absolutely, and one of the, the roles we have played is that we've created a, a agency-wide um, entity called the Gender Equity Interagency Partnership, where all city agencies will work together to uh, identify programs and services that address the needs of uh, individuals across their lifespan, be they girls, women, transgender, gender nonconforming individuals. We operate with intersectional lens, and so our role will be to help identify what exists, to support the amplification of what exists, because the connection of that information to community so that it's utilized is a key uh, area that we want to help bring greater focus to. And then finally, to work with city agencies to share information across agencies so that uh, you know we have deeper resources. So over time, we are going to be partnering with agencies. And as the programs are developed and fleshed out, the Commission on Gender Equity will be a key partner in the process. But part of the you know taking care of the older adults are the health and hospital are they prepared? Are they, do they have the, the resources in terms of the geriatric care, like specialty mm -hmm. where they really f focus on the needs of the older adult population? I can't speak definitively to that now, but they are a member of this interagency partnership. And clearly, you know, as I said in my testimony, we recognize that as you age, healthcare is a critical aspect of it. And so we want to be deepening our focus there. I don't know if Karen has yeah. anything to add. Um, we are really strengthening our partnership with health and hospitals um, and have been working much more collaboratively together. And I do know 
um, at Harlem Hospital, they developed a geriatric um, part of the emergency room. So it's specifically designed for older adults so they do not get in the queue with the general population when they enter the emergency room. And I think that's a pilot that um, may spread throughout the system and we've been advocating for that. That, that's good. I mean, I think we definitely need to do more of that because a lot of the primary care doctor, um, even from my own personal experience with my mom, I mean, they just don't look at uh, aging issues like onset of, you know, dementia or whatever. They don't even test um, the senior on those things. It just like, they're not trained. And so we need to figure out how do we, you know, provide that training to healthcare worker and to be able to take care of the, the, the special needs for our you know, older adult um, population. Uh, before I continue, I'm gonna turn over to my colleague, uh, Council Member Vallone, and oh, Council Member Landa, do you also have a question? Okay, so Council Member Vallone, you wanna go first? Just, just quickly, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you both for your testimony. Um, Chair Chin, and all of us have been talking about for years the interagency cooperation and that you can't tackle this alone. And you just testified that it's your hope to expand that. Well, that's been our hope for years. So I'd like to delve down a little further on what you mean by it's your hope to expand that, what direct programs will there be interagency cooperation on, and maybe there's a, a chance here for additional funding stream to expand that so it's not just DIFTA's responsibility on dealing with the largest segment of our population. Mm -hmm. The Gender Equity Interagency Partnership um, was just created as a result of the Commission's strategic plan, which we released in September. The group has met. We have commitments from 57 agencies already, and they have assigned 77 staff, including the gender equity liaisons that were created through the Young Women's Initiative. So we are taking a you know, with the mayor's guidance around equity, we're taking a focus where every single agency will begin to talk about and look at their work from a gender lens, but also an intersectional lens and a lens that looks at the human rights aspect of New Yorkers. So, But we, senior wasn't in that sentence. But senior is in that sentence but because, I, well, I didn't say it, the intersectional lens also impacts age. And so there are myriad factors that we consider intersectional. There's ethnicity, there's ability, there's age, and I listed them in my testimony. So it's not just one angle. And you know, when you think of age, you, you think of gender intersecting with age, but also intersecting, intersecting with race, intersecting with faith. So you, it's this much more complex look. And each one of those are meritorious and deserve their Absolutely. own. Absolutely. My, my fear, once again, for always defending seniors is that this will become part of a much larger conversation and will not get addressed appropriately. I, I applaud the creation and the 77 yeah. jobs and, and the interagency look at this for the first time. But I, I really believe, and I will never stop, along with Margaret yeah. Chin and the rest of the council, advocating for seniors' own initiative and looking at the demands of the largest population in the country of seniors and the fact that we have yet to increase the budget. We have yet to increase new plans for this and we keep talking about a senior tsunami and, and no, nothing is changing. Mm -hmm. If so we don't I, change our budget and we don't change our focus and we right. don't add programs and just lump them in with everyone else's wonderful ideas, how do we go back to a demographic and say, we are championing you? Not everyone, and I get everyone, but this is not what this committee is about. This committee is about seniors right now, and I, I, I want to hear focus on that. And I know Karen has been fighting for that, and now that she's in that position, and we'll get to go to this budget together for the first time, she knows exactly where the chair and I are, have been talking about for five years now. Um, it's time, and with a budget of this size and a magnitude of funding coming in from Wall Street and everywhere else, and everyone else getting tossed $100 million here and there for other programs, we have to do the same for seniors, have to. So is there, is there an opportunity then with this program maybe to section out seniors or add an additional 
emphasis on that? And then I'll turn it over to Councilmember Lane. Ab absolutely. I'll just simple answer is absolutely um, that that's sort of the goal. You know, the, the important thing is that for us to recognize, and, and you know, aging is a process. And so one of the things we want to be able to do is really to help individuals address aging, not when you're <clears> at 65, but as you approach 65. And so building healthy habits, healthy uh, along the way. And so that we don't, you know, I've heard somebody say, you're, you're fortunate if you age because the alternative is not such a good option, <laughs> at least in our world. So we want to make sure that this is a part of the horizon that individuals, when you're young, you think about aging. We talk about grandparents. We talk about how exactly. that's, <laughs> and that, that's what an we need integral to look part at. of life. And so we do believe that agencies are actually serving the populations as they age, and we need to strengthen that work. So we're in full agreement with you. So maybe we can tackle that. So if, yeah. a, if a client comes into our office and we do elder law planning, mm -hmm. the client that comes into me at 45 and 50, I can help. The client yes. that comes into me at 85 and 90, I say, why didn't you come in 25 years ago? Well, mm -hmm. and, and that's the hard question that they, so we waited too long. And well, I think that's I exactly we what would, we don't want to say. Yeah, we don't, we and we don't want to turn folks away. They're folks who are immediately 85 and who need that service. I think the strategy we want to be able to determine is what services we have now for that population. Where are our gaps? And then how do we mitigate future populations not ending up in the crisis situation, which clearly, you know, and I think the mayor in his health care plan and in the retirement account is beginning to look at that longer term strategy. This does not negate the necessity to focus on the population that's currently 65. And I'm above. excited to hear your words. I'm excited to work with you. We all are. So thank let's you. let's develop that. Thank yes. you. Council Member Lander, thank okay. you very much. Council Member Lander. Thank you, Madam Chair, as always, for leading us on these issues, and thanks to both of you for your good, strong work. Um, I just want to continue in this vein, and uh, you know, I really appreciate all the work you guys are doing. Each initiative is important. People need a lot of different kinds of supports, and you're providing them, and, and that is strong, and obviously there's more we can do, and of course the budget fights are important. Um, I do want to talk about some of the big picture things, though, that we can push on. You know, if we hadn't done the fighting in previous generations for Medicare, you know, we wouldn't have it. And, you know, and for Social Security, the same way, right? It's often instead of Social Security and Medicare, we have been forced to have, like, an array of different programs funded at the local level with what we could acquire each year in the budget millions more people would be in just, you know, impossible poverty. So I'm trying to think about what's next there. And in some ways, the ideas the mayor laid out in the state of the city head in that direction. But, you know, the private ret retirement account idea is really just an opportunity for people to save their own money earlier, which is not going to get us where we need to go. And and the health care outreach expansion is strong, but but I think one thing, so I'm just trying to think about what's next that we can really be pushing for. And the thing that I see on the horizon in this area isn't even really something at the local level. It's what might happen at the state level. There are, as you may know, a crew of people pushing as part of the New York State Health Act for long-term care to be a universal opportunity and requirement uh, that would be part of a statewide single-payer system. Uh, and that is ambitious, like we're not there this week, I guess they're doing the DREAM Act today, so, um, but it's not so far out of sight either. Um, and it just seems to me, at least as I see it, that the next really big step that we could organize to take, um, and it'll need a lot of pushing from New York City um, and from all around the state, is that. It's like a single payer New York State health care program with a long term care right that people would have to age into, and then we wouldn't have to scrap for a few more nickels in every budget here and worry about whether people were on the home care list, like the resources and opportunity would be there. So um, I didn't see that in your testimony. I haven't yet heard the mayor come out in favor of that, uh, uh, you know, but I, I guess I wanna ask, do you agree that that's a direction we should be heading? And, and if so, what do you think that we could be doing to, to push in that direction without negating all the other good work that, that both of your organizations are doing. So at, as the department, we have not taken an official mm -hmm. policy position. Um, in my life as an advocate for seniors, I could say that you know when I began this work a long time ago, <laughs> since I too have aged in place, um, you know, looking at long-term 
health needs is obviously one of the most critical parts of being able to age in place. So as an advocate, in my role as an advocate, I would say wholeheartedly that that would really solve a lot of problems. Um, we do have a program, which I did not talk about in my very extensive <laughs> testimony, called New York Connects. And while it doesn't provide all of the long-term care solutions, it can at least hook somebody up with what is out there, because it's impossible to figure out what's out there and how to access it. So we do have a program where people, not only older people of any age that need to access the long-term care system can call and get help and linked to the appropriate care. And in the commission strategic plan, we talk about creating change in, in, in four ways. One of, I won't name all four, but one, one of those ways is, is policy and advocacy work. So we will definitely work to investigate this approach. Uh, we clearly care about healthcare. It's one of our leading, our focus areas. And again, because we work across the lifespan, this is something that we will, will look into and build into a part of our legislative and advocacy work. All right, thank you. Well, I guess I'll just uh, say to both chairs, I think one great thing that these committees and the council could do is put in our state and legislate, start a state uh, advocacy agenda this year, a strong council push for both the New York Health Act, but with a long-term care right. Um, and I guess I would just urge the administration to do the same thing as well. Many other good things we can do, but to me, that would be the biggest step we could take forward for for seniors and especially for women in, in poverty. And, and I'll add that the way that the advocates are structuring that, it not only is about giving a long-term care right to, uh, the, to people who are aging, but also really focusing on good living wage employment for the caregivers, the vast yeah. majority of mm -hmm. whom are also women, mm -hmm. um, many of whom have been in poverty or are near it, um, and lifting both caregivers up and seniors up, I think would really uh, sit well at this intersection. Perfect. So I hope yeah. we Thank in the you. council and you in the administration can push it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Chair uh, Margaret Chin. Um, if I could just step in for a quick moment. Two questions. One has to do with the mayor's announced retirement program. I'm so excited, in theory, um, about this, but the devil is always in the details. Do you have any more information about um, Not what it might time. look like, who Not would be included? the city, um, who would administer it, how much money we're talking about, whether or not it would be connected to the controller's responsibility for uh, in, you know, city employee pension funds. What's your thinking? I'm, I'm sorry to say that I don't have any details. Um, as Council Member Lander suggested, it's an opportunity for people to save, which is very important, but the, I'm not clear what the impact for older adults would be. So it's less so in our wheelhouse. We expect that the commission will be involved in the process as it becomes clearer. So I'll be working on finding out exactly those issues uh, in short order. Is any agency currently responsible for developing the details? That has not been made clear. It's just that we don't know at this time, but we can find that out. Um, thank you. I appreciate well, that very much. Um, but may I ask, is there anyone here from City Hall who might know about what the mayor had in mind when he made that announcement, if I may? No one's here. Okay. Um, uh, for the record, no one leapt to the floor, <laughs> but um, making that request right now that the administration uh, share their thoughts. Thank you, Councilmember Chin, that the, the that City Hall share their thoughts with uh, the City Council, uh, the Committee on Aging, Committee on Women, on. <coughs> what even the broad strokes are, um, who would administer it, um, how 
uh, money would get put into such a fund, whether or not there would be a connection with the controller's uh, employee, um, New York City employee retirement funds, um, currently over roughly $200 billion, how that would get woven in. I mean, this is a very exciting idea, but um, you know, it's important to know what the timetable is, um, who would be eligible, who would not be eligible, um, whether or not what the rollout for marketing would be, who would be encouraged to participate. Um, are we talking at all about freelancers? Um, whether or not domestic workers would be included. I mean, it's very, very exciting. Um, and, and I know our shared committees would be very interested in helping out in any way we can, but hearing more, perhaps having a, a full hearing on this topic when the administration is ready to share its plans. Um, secondly, I wanted to ask about uh, the healthcare interagency partnership, if you have any more details um, about whether or not uh, you'll be establishing a plan um, under the guaranteed health care, whether or not that's part of the interagency partnership um, focus, is it a priority, uh, and sort of where's the administration on that? So the gender equity interagency partnership is an opportunity for the city to create an integrated and sustained way of driving at achieving gender equity within the three areas of focus. So health and reproductive justice is uh, one of the commission's areas of focus. And yes, as the healthcare efforts begin to roll out, we want to be able through this uh, interagency partnership to determine where and to have agencies inform the Commission on Gender Equity um, their role in each aspect of it so that, and what's really important to us, that we can amplify and connect uh, citizens to this, to this service. Uh, so yes, it, we intend it to be a part of the work, and um, we're first beginning, I should say, by developing a landscape study to determine the services that are applicable across all city agencies to individuals regardless of gender identity and gender expression. So that study, we're just looking at the tool to do that work, and uh, we'll reconvene our commission, um, our interagency partnership in about March to get it started. I'd like to just add to that that um, actually yesterday, um, my staff met with um, Metro Plus, and it was the beginning discussion of how we can work together, um, and we would like to open the doors at our senior centers to allow them to come in and share information about the program and help any seniors that may not have selected or are not in a, a long-term care or managed care program to learn about their benefits and services. So we're really looking forward to growing that partnership. Uh, I was just noting to my colleague that I think I was, uh, um, I still worked for the administration when Metro Plus started um, many years ago. So that's great that the Department of Aging would be involved uh, more. That's really good. Um, actually, two more quick questions. Um, do you do any uh, specific analysis or tracking of our transgender community or gender non-conforming to understand whether or not they're having access to services as they age. SAGE is a marvelous um, nonprofit that works with the older community. Is that a, an organization you work with? How do we know what's happening? with our transgender and non gender non-conforming community, as well as the LGBT community? Uh, so the department is a funder of SAGE. We are very proud that it was the first LGBT senior center in the country. Um, and we meet with them quite frequently about advocacy as well as their services. Um, 
we as an agency don't do particular tracking. I know that they're quite involved in doing their own tracking, and we work with other organizations that are also providing services to LGBT aging communities, such as Grio Circle. There are, and Queens Community House has an absolutely wonderful program as well. Um, but as an agency, we're not doing any particular tracking of the transgender community needs. Okay, so let's put that as a question out there, that if you could get back to the committees about the work that, about those agencies in particular, and there are probably more, the work they're doing, the number of people they're helping, the nature of the services they provide, and frankly, whether or not they see a wait list, whether or not they see demand for um, services from the LGBT community, and uh, whether or not, you know, trying to identify whether or not the city is really serving them adequately, um, has services in place for them. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to get back to this notion of caregivers um, and, and sort of what happens when women step back from the traditional workplace um, and, and instead um, are caregivers to children or parents or other family members sort of whether or not that reality is wrapped into the city hall's ideas about um, the, the expanded retirement package and whether or not uh, people who have played that role in their family, um, how they might be accommodated or uh, might be too challenging. Um, to accommodate, but sort of whether or not the administration is thinking about that. And in particular, as I think about that, I think about uh, survivors of domestic violence who are often, um, whether or not their uh, partner, how their partner talks about what's happening in the household, the reality for survivors that they're written out of any type of economic security, and whether or not the administration in, th in thinking about their retirement plans or services, how they think about uh, survivors of domestic violence in particular, um, whose needs are, are great and often overlooked, as is the case with um, our LGBT community. So, I mean, that train of thought is what was key to the commission stating explicitly the need to focus on building, uh, closing the gender asset gap and the wealth gap. We anchor that strategy in the role of caregivers, both paid and unpaid. And so, as you know, the commission's next first meeting of the year is happening in a week or two, February 7th. Um, <laughs> It's where we begin to look in the economic mobility area, how can we work smartly around caregiving, and I think you bring a, a critical lens to this. As we anticipate the retirement plans, how do we count for this exit and re-entry into workforce when we build retirement plans? So I think those are the key things that we will you know, start to factor in um, and underscore again the unique opportunity that the commission has to keep as it plays a role in, in the building out of these broader issues. You know, the truth of the matter is that's where it's most exciting. Right. Um, so I'm not sure, in this analysis, if I were doing it, mm -hmm. um, there's an element to which you always start with low-hanging fruit, but on the other hand, when we talk about this topic in particular, right. um, the community that really needs it yeah. are those disenfranchised um, women, members of the LGBT, a BTQ community and, and also survivors of DV and, and also um, those with disabilities. I think that's where uh, you could have a really exciting impact and make a real difference in people's lives. And I would almost start there um, if I were well, yeah, charged no, thank with you. doing this. Thank you, and I think that's the absolute role of the commission and, and your partnership in helping us get there is going to be 
beyond essential. <laughs> As always, it's a pleasure working with you, um, Director Ebanks and Acting Commissioner um, Resnick. It's great to see you, but hang on one second. I'm just going to make sure my co-chair uh, check if she has any remaining questions. And again, I apologize to the public, but I am gonna have to step back <laughs> into the uh, competing meetings that I have today. Thank you. Well, in, your, in the budget negotiation meeting, just yeah. make sure that you're advocating for older adults. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. We've been joined by Council Member Rose uh, on the Committee on Aging, and she has a couple of questions. Good afternoon, and um, thank you so much, um, Madam Chair, for indulging um, my lateness. I, too, am at the budget negotiating um, team meeting, um, and it's very important that Council Member Rosenthal and I's voices and other women's voices are at that table. Um, so it's really hard for me to figure out when to extract myself from that because, um, you know, we need vocal advocates to fight for women on all fronts, aging women, young women, um, and, and, and women across the spectrum. So um, my brief question, maybe comment, is um, uh, contributing factors to, um, to women aging in poverty in New York City I believe is um, the gender pay, gender pay disparities, um, which start at a very early age. As the chair of the, um, the youth committee, um, we're looking at um, trying to legislate um, the teen gender-based pay um, disparities, um, you know, and uh, we're looking to try to close that gap early on, early on because um, it starts very young and it makes it very difficult to close that gap. Um, um, and, and I think if we address it at a very early stage, we would see less women aging in poverty. And so um, I'm wondering, is the administration, is there anyone who um, is looking at gender pay equity, you know, as an important enough uh, starting point to stem all of the negative impacts that we're, we've talked about here today. You know, economic, social health, it, um, a lot of it begins, you know, now. It begins very early on when women are not getting the same pay. How can you um, age um, at the same rate? You know, it impacts your retirement levels. Um, you're not putting the same amount into the pension because you're not getting the same amount. Um, and it, it just snowballs. Yeah. It snowballs. So um, I, I think if we address that, that would be a huge contributing factor to, you know, the impact that we see down the road. And I, I want to know, is there anyone who's looking at this in, you know, sort of holistically and, and, and looking at how important wage disparities yes. play into um, all of these issues we've discussed today? Yes. No, thank you so much for that, Council Member Rose. Um, yes, the Commission on Gender Equity looks exactly at those issues within its economic mobility and opportunity focus area. And in fact, there are three things we talk about. One is the underrepresentation of women in leadership positions across all sectors, which also affects your earning potential as well. The other piece is clearly the pay equity gap, and we explicitly say that one of our goals and our strategies is to close the, pay, the gender pay gap. And finally, if we don't address those gaps, women can't build assets, you can't build wealth, and it's almost naturally disrupted because of our societal um, predisposition to place women in the caregiving role, right? So we are the ones who are exiting and re-entering the workforce, which is a huge disruptor to our earnings. I do want to underscore that this, the, the city, the mayor, 
has signed the salary history ban, which we do think for future generations and for those of us currently working, never disclosing our salary history will ensure that we're not pegged anymore to that historically low salary with which we entered the workforce. And I think that's a key effort. Now we really need to look at actually transferring the dollars, right? So I think we have the policies in place um, from federal legislation to, as I said, the, the salary history ban in the city. Now there needs to be some focused effort on, well, how does, do we actually close that gap. And some of our corporate citizens, last year we heard of Citigroup and Salesforce that really looked at it and closed the gap. We're trying to learn from those efforts and also trying as a city to, to begin to lead in that effort. But you're absolutely right, it's one element. And needless to say, however, it, it's not everything uh, because health, disruptions to health happen. Uh, you know, safety vulnerabilities happen. And so, but we want to make sure that the area we can probably best control is economic mobility as more women are being educated, right? Um, there's so many things that we have to look at to ensure that we have the living wage right. and that we are paid equitably in the world. We're working really hard to codify, you know, um, equity, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, you know, I, I want to see us uh, work harder at enforcing it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. We've been uh, joined by Councilmember Eugene. Uh, do you have any questions? No. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, there's one question that I would like to ask. I don't know if the question has been asked and answered before. It's about uh, SSI for the adult. Did they ask that question already? Now we know that you know the senior who are not who don't have immigration status, they are not qualified for SSI. Is there anything, any help, any assistance to those senior citizens who are also in dire need of this program? I'm sorry, actually, I don't have an answer to the question, but I can certainly go back and, and get information, and I don't know if there's any advocacy that's going on in order to address that. But as I did testify to, you know, the majority of programs and services we have are really targeted to lower income um, older adults, and so we tried to do everything we can to get people living in poverty and without resources to avail themselves of our programs and services. I do understand uh, your situation and the services that you are providing, but those people also, and thank you also for your answer because you are not providing this type of services right now. You cannot answer that and you don't handle such situation. But what I want to say is that many of those people, they are also living in poverty. Mm -hmm. Many of those people, they have the same needs, you know, uh, you know as the other senior citizens that you are serving. And I think that uh, for the fact that they are already in the United States, regardless of your condition, or their condition, uh, the immigration condition, regardless of where they come from, I think that they deserve also to have some assistance because this is a question of human right. Mm -hmm. Because we are living in the United States of America, this great country is what it is. It is because of immigrants, regardless of the way or the ways they came to the United States. Some of them, they came before, they were lucky to, to be here on time. They have the immigration status, they have green card, they are citizens, but those who don't have it, Probably they were not so lucky or so fortunate. But as you know, we know the, the, this country, United States, is a country that welcomes everybody, regardless who you are. And those people who came over here, many of those senior citizens, they have worked also. They have contributed also to the fabric of United States of America. For one or either reason, they don't have the immigration status. But I think it is fair enough for us as a country, as the United States, to think about them also. Because when they become sick, if they don't have treatment, 
we all could be affected by that. And it is a human right issue also. Thank you so very much for your answer. And I hope that uh, as a city, as a country, we will probably think about that and see how we can address that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a follow-up question um, uh, for you, Commissioner. The, the two program that the mayor announced in his state of the city, um, is DIFTA involved in terms of implementation and how is that gonna be, how is DIFTA gonna be affected um, by these two programs in terms of the, the healthcare program and, and the, the retirement saving program? So the details of those programs have not been shared with us yet, and I think they're under development, so it's not clear to me what role we will have um, in either of the programs. But do you have an opportunity to have input? Yes, and Knowing and from we your will. our experience, I mean, I think that that is something that we wanted to we'll see. We'll make sure that we're at the table and, and are involved in any way that we can be. Good. Um, now, from both of your testimony, you are, you know, acknowledging that older women are aging into poverty. Are there any kind of new initiative or ideas that, that you want to kind of put forward that can help uh, deal with this issue? I think we talked about some of them. These are systems issues, and um, we just talked about pay equity, and I think being able to address those issues before you have aged in to your, into poverty, you know, are the way to address them. Um, unfortunately, our programs and services have really, you can look at them as safety net programs, so we're here to help those who have aged into poverty. Um, I think we're gonna have to all work together to try and make the societal and systemic changes in order to stave off poverty, particularly among women. I mean, part of it is also the, the resolution that we put forward to the federal government um, to encourage them to pass the protection of, for all the worker against discrimination. I think on the city level, in terms of the interagency and, and moving forward, that we also have to um, make it easier or encourage people to file age discrimination claim with the Human Rights Commission if they know that they're doing the same job as, uh, as their colleague but they're getting paid less uh, or they're not able um, to get a job and go from interview to interview and people are telling them things like, oh, you're overqualified but you know that they're, they're saying you're, you're older and they don't want to hire an older worker. Uh, I think that really encouraging and educating uh, the older adult population that they have a right uh, to file and we can, uh, your interagency work with the uh, Human Rights Commission. Yeah. I think that that would be very, very critical. And then the other part with the interagency is the whole workforce development. Oftentimes, you know, the workforce center, they're not focusing on the older adults. I mean, even the Title V program yeah. um, that you talked about, Carolyn, that, you know, the success, but even that, that is really low wage job. And also for a lot of the, uh, the senior that are in those program, while they are working, what the feedback I've gotten is like, there is no, no benefit, no pension. Uh, so it's still stuck in a low wage job. Uh, so the, the workforce training, giving them more skills so they can compete, um, that is critical. And that is something that I think across the board, a lot of the job training program that the city fund, I don't think they're focusing or even the paying attention no. to the older worker yeah. and figure a way how to help them. Because I said in my opening statement that older workers, they're not just our present, they're our future. Mm -hmm. And that and that this population is growing. Um, and very soon there's gonna be more older adults than young kids. Yeah. And we need to prepare for that. And because they still have so much to contribute. And want uh, to contribute. And want to contribute. I mean, our senior center would not function <laughs> if it wasn't for the senior who volunteer to make those programs run. 
right? So I think that, uh, that is so critical. And I think in this budget process, I hope that DIFTA do you know, look at and work with us in the council to see how we can expand you know, more of this program. As you say, a safety net program, it helps uh, uh, the older adult uh, age healthier, especially the senior center. Uh, so we need to look at it, maybe expanding on those programs and not shrinking those programs. Because from your own study, you're saying that people, the seniors that participate in senior center, they're healthier, they're, they're stronger, they're less depression. I mean, all the good things so that we need to really expand those programs because the population, the older population is also expanding. So we look forward to, um, to working, to continue working with you and make sure that the new initiative that the mayor is putting forward, that that also serve the older adult population. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So thank you for being here today. And uh, we are going to call up the, uh, the public panel. Okay. Uh, we have Kathleen. Oh, Caitlin Hosey from Live On New York. Molly Krakowski from JASA. Kristen Rowe. Rose, Radical Age Movement. I apologize if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. And also Alice Fisher from Radical Age Movement. Come on up. You may begin. Thank you, Chair Chin, for having us today, and Councilmember Rosenthal as well, of course. Um, we, I feel like the issue here has been well illuminated through the testimony that has come, so I won't spend as much time on that as is in my written testimony. Uh, the struggles have been articulated from lower wages, increased caregiving costs, rising housing and long-term care costs, and more. Um, our benefits team at Live On New York sees this every day on a real human level. The majority of the clients that come into our benefits office seeking assistance with SNAP, SCREE, DRE, other um, public programs are older women. Um, and many of these older women are living on as little as $15,000 a year, which is the average amount of uh, Social Security um, that you receive, and that's a fixed income that is very difficult to live on in a high cost city such as New York City is. Um, so th what has been articulated is just the tip of the iceberg of identifying just why older women are aging into poverty. But we wanna spend most of our testimony on what can New York City do to solve this and to support the older women to, for a certain extent, have experience these structural barriers across the lifespan and now are in a position where they need to make ends meet and to be able to thrive in their older years despite a number of barriers. Um, before I start with our recommendations, I wanted to articulate um, the realities that exist related to home care and case management because I know you asked a few questions about this. Uh, the wait lists that were explicated by DIFTA are our understanding of the situation as well. However, I wanted to note that in Brooklyn and the Bronx, home care hours have been frozen again, unfortunately. So that means any new client that comes in to receive home care, unfortunately, that wait list is likely to begin to rise. Additionally, it's important to keep in mind that for a case manager, the caseload size are capped at 65, which is quite high. So you're limited in your ability to truly dive in and support the clients. I'm sure every case manager would love a lower um, client ratio to be able to truly serve their clients in the way that they were taught to do so in um, getting their social work degree. So I just wanted to note that, um, of course, Levon is super appreciative of the state's investment that is being made, but we wanted to put that on the record as well. So a, a few concrete examples of dis DIPTA services that could use additional support that would directly and positively impact this population. 
Um, for older women living in poverty, nutrition is incredibly, incredibly important. Within DIFTA's home delivered meal program, 81% of meal recipients note that the home delivered meals improve their overall health and accounts for more than half of their total food um, caloric intake for the day. That is one meal accounting for half of your overall nutrition for the day. That shows the value of this meal. Um, to better support the system and the congregate meals program as well, because we know that's equally as valuable, the city must increase funding by $20 million this year to ensure the solvency of the program. This is both to ensure quality meals, to ensure that chefs working in these programs are paid adequately, and to ensure that the nonprofits are not footing the burden of the lower reimbursement rate. Additionally, we wanted to point out that the entire network of services, this was well articulated by Commissioner Resnick, but the entire network of aging services plays a unique role in alleviating the burdens that are associated with aging into poverty. By increasing funding for services such as senior centers and NORCs, we can ensure that the quality of the program continues as costs rise and as the number of seniors that they are serving rises because we know that there are about 31% of the 50 plus population across the United States are um, the homeless population across the United States, 31% of those are 50 plus. And senior centers are certainly seeing this. Senior centers are serving the most vulnerable of our older adults and we need to make sure that funding is there to ensure that the quality programming, the one-to-one -one support can be offered and it's not all just one director trying to man an entire facility. Additionally, um, mentioned was the geriatric mental, geriatric mental Health Initiative. Currently, that's only in 25 senior centers. That feels like it's right for expanding to make sure that older women are able to talk to somebody and able to get the supports that they need no matter where they are in the city. Um, additionally, it's really important to note that we, we talked a lot about the lower wages that contribute to aging into poverty. For a lot of women in the human services sector, that is the reality that exists in New York City. Many senior center directors are women. Many case managers are women. And we need to make sure that the city, through the, the services that it's funding, are funding livable wages and high quality competitive salaries to make sure that the human services sector in New York City doesn't age into poverty as has been the trend. So we really appreciate your support on all of these issues. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Molly Krakowski. I'm Director of Legislative Affairs at JASA. Um, and uh, as I've said in previous hearings, and I, again, will also be brief, um, JASA has a whole range of contracts with New York City, everything from adult protective services, um, community guardian uh, clients. We have 22 senior centers, um, a dozen NORCs. We have a, a lot of um, uh, programs, case management, home delivered meals. Um, caregiver support. So we're sort of touching, I think, on almost every area that DIFTA has to offer. And um, and I'm going to sort of reiterate what Caitlin said and also um, the commissioner, the acting commissioner Resnick, um, very accurately, I think, portrayed that there is this massive safety net within New York City. The problem is the funding and the underfunding of these contracts. And so I feel a little bit like a broken record. It's my, it's become my role in these hearings to talk about it. Um, but um, the aging demographics, I think we all know. Um, but the underfunding of the human services contracts can't be separated from the relevance of a hearing like today. Uh, not only do the human services need to be paid fully for the services that we provide, but the staff needs to be paid a livable wage, like Caitlin said. And the city has increased wages in some programs, but not all programs. And um, so you can imagine, we have now case management um, has, has gotten um, a, a nice increase, um, a long overdue increase, um, but the NORC directors haven't. So NORC directors are making less than case management workers. And um, APS just got an increase, but the directors of APS didn't get an increase. And we have senior centers where now with the $15 minimum wage, it's wonderful, but we have people who are 
professionals who are making $2 an hour more than them. Um, so we haven't kept up, and um, we need the city really to recognize and invest in the workforce that provides the essential services that keep people, women, older adults, safe in their homes and communities, and we need the city to make the connection and to put the necessary funding into the budget. There are too many people struggling to make ends meet. Uh, we need to find a way to change the tide, um, and if we really want to sort of nip this in the butt before it becomes a much bigger problem and as more people age into poverty, um, then we need to start at home and, and fix the situation with all these contracts. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kristen Roars, a master's in social work student and intern at the Radical Age Movement, and I'll be sharing just some highlights from Bobby Sackman's testimony, um, among many other things. She's a steering committee member of the Radical Age Movement. And she says, on behalf of thousands of older women in New York City living in quiet desperation, struggling daily with economic insecurity, I would like to thank chairs Councilwoman Margaret Chin and Councilwoman Helen Rosenthal and committee members for holding this hearing. Simply put, Radical Age Movement was founded to confront ageism and advocate for age justice in its myriad of forms. Among the poorest individuals in New York City are older women of color and immigrants, yet they are mostly invisible. In framing issues of older women aging into poverty, it is critical to take into account that becoming poor in old age is often the result of a lifetime of being marginalized in the workplace. Thousands of older adults are declaring bankruptcy due to inadequate income and medical bills. A 2018 AARP study says about three in five older workers have either seen or experienced age discrimination in the workplace. In a December 2018 investigative article by ProPublica in collaboration with an Urban Institute study reported 56% of workers over age 50 leave their jobs involuntarily due to layoff or business closing, job dissatisfaction, or unexpected retirement. Nationally, only five years from now, in 2024, women aged 55 plus are projected to be 25% of the women's labor force, which is double their share from 2000. This is New York City's future. We recommend the establishment of a task force to address issues of age discrimination in the workplace. Using data from the Consumer Bankruptcy Project, we find more than a two-fold increase in the rate at which older Americans, age 65 and over, file for bankruptcy. Older Americans report they are struggling with increased financial risks, namely inadequate income and unmanageable costs of health care, as they try to deal with reductions to their social safety net. Certainly one primary solution to the increase in bankruptcy among older women would be to establish a single-payer universal long-term care system in New York State. We are very appreciative that 44 council members signed on to a resolution following a four-hour health committee hearing to support the New York Health Act. Thank you for the opportunity to, t to testify today at this important hearing. Radical Age Movement looks forward to working with city council members to maximize the leverage New York City has to protect older women from age discrimination in the workplace, preventing personal bankruptcy, providing uh, supportive services and access to benefits. It's necessary to prevent poverty in old age and to bring older women off the financial cliff. Please also see the attached working policy agenda. My name is Alice Fisher, founder and director of the Radical Age Movement. I'd like to thank Councilwomen Margaret Chin and Helen Rosenthal for holding this very important hearing. For the past one and a half years, the Radical Age Movement has focused on issues of age discrimination in the American workforce. From our consciousness raising and age cafe programs, we've identified that the greatest concern of our members and followers is running out of money before they run out of life. There is no shortage of older adults in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s who are desperately seeking a way to earn a living after leaving the workforce, mostly, or many often not by their own choice. We see ageism in general, and particularly in the workforce, as a systemic cause of poverty among older adults. 
These people are mostly invisible to the general public and our institutions because they are beyond the common description of middle age and they are not yet old by today's evolving demographics. The lifespan is not a fixed and permanent measure of our length of days. Rather, it is a flexible, ever-changing instrument that indicates the stages of life we go through. As life expectancy and health expectancy grow longer, changes in the lifespan are a natural result. The extra healthy years we are gaining are not tacked on to the end of our lives. Instead, a new age of life has a new stage of life has opened up along the lifespan. People between the ages of 60 and 80 plus occupy this new phase of life. If they are relatively healthy, they tend not to be ready to leave the workforce because they don't want to retire and they can't afford to be retired for 20, 30, or 40 years. If we live longer, we have to work longer. Radical age sees ageism as a major systemic cause of poverty in older adults. If the workforce turns its back on this group of older adults, while both Social Security and Medicare have not evolved to meet the needs of most older adults, our country is headed towards a major disaster. Prior to the creation of Social Security, older adults were the poorest cohort of Americans. If we don't acknowledge these evolving changes, we will go full circle when older adults will once again become the poorest demographic of people living among us. Um, Unfortunately, many more women than men will find themselves in this untenable situation. Some of the circumstances that push women into poverty at a greater rate than men are caregiving, wage gaps, higher health care costs, deaths of a spouse or divorce, the wealth gap, discrimination, and domestic violence. Another issue is affordable housing and fear of the bag lady syndrome. The bag lady syndrome that so many women fear is not that far-fetched for many females over 50. Due to their low pay, lack of employer-provided retirement, retirement plans, and increasingly longer lifespans and higher medical costs than men, they are slammed from all sides as they age. During my tenure in Senator Liz Kruger's office, the most dire situation with which I was confronted were homeless elderly people and I use 85 years plus to describe somebody who's elderly. Uh, for the most of them, a maximum stipend of 100 to $200 a month would allow them to pay their rent and stay in their homes. We know that it costs the city way more to keep these people in a homeless shelter where they do not belong and are extremely luck reluctant for good reason to go there. These are not people who just need a leg up so they can move ahead with their lives. This is likely their final destination. A solution that seems so simple has never gained traction. Why not subsidize people over 85 years old who are living below the poverty level and cannot afford their rent? As the demographic of older adults keeps growing, this is not a problem that will go away any time, if ever, in the near future. I'm going to skip the statistics. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we look forward to working with city council members in an effort to protect older women from age discrimination in the workplace, preventing personal bankruptcy, access to benefits, and providing supported services. Now is the time to call for age justice. After all, we are part of the future, too. Thank you. I mean, thank you all for your testimony and for all your great work. And especially in this budget season, um, I think we're going to have to work together to make sure that the recommendation that you put forward in terms of um, paying you know, um, our human service worker a better wage, uh, we definitely need to work on that. So thank you for being here today. Um, we're calling up the last panel. Peter Kempter from Volunteers of Legal Services, and uh, Kay Webster from Rivington House Neighbors.
Peter, you can stop. Yeah, you can start. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Peter Kempner. I'm the director of the Elderly Project at Volunteers of Legal Service. Volunteers of Legal Service was established in 1984 in response to federal cuts in legal services funding. At the time, the city's largest and most respected law firms teamed up with the New York City Bar Association to help fill the gap left by those federal funding cuts. Uh, we are now 35 years into our existence and Volunteers of Legal Service run six projects, including our elderly project, which conducts regular free legal clinics at senior centers around the city, including two in your district, Council Member Chin. And we provide technical support and to community-based organizations serving low-income seniors. By answering legal questions faced by their clients, we provide training on legal issues to community-based organizations and to the public regarding proper end-of-life planning. We publish an advocate's guide to SCREE and a guide to burial assistance and funeral planning for New York City's um, New Yorkers in need. We also access pro bono services of the private bar by training and supervising and pairing up volunteer lawyers with low-income seniors who cannot afford to hire attorneys to get their powers of attorney, health care proxies, living wills, last wills and testaments, as well as other advanced directives done free of charge. These critical documents ensure that the wishes of seniors are carried out by the people they love and trust the most. They also ensure that seniors are able to live in the community as long as possible and help to avoid costly and unpleasant legal proceedings like guardianships in the event that they become incapacitated. We thank the City Council's Aging and Women's Committee for holding this important oversight hearing, looking into the root causes of women aging into poverty as attorneys serving low-income elderly New Yorkers, we see every day the legal issues they face, including those involving housing, government benefits, and consumer debt. At the root, all of these are poverty issues. Uh, from our work in the community, we see that these issues disproportionately impact women. In preparation for this hearing, I looked over the past year of our client data and found that 72% of our clients were women. This should not be surprising in light of the fact that elderly women are much more likely to be poor than men, representing two-thirds of all individuals over the age of 65 living in poverty. This reality is further exasperated when looking at elderly women of color. Numerous factors contribute to this, including the gender pay gap disparities that were discussed earlier, um, caregiver responsibilities, and higher health care costs for women. Uh, in a rapidly gentrifying city like New York, we need to ensure that comprehensive services and programs are in place so that our seniors can age in their communities with dignity and respect. Programs such as the Senior Citizen Rent Increase Exemption, the Senior Citizen Homeowners Exemption are necessary to stabilize housing costs for our low-income seniors. Social programs and senior centers, which provide case management services, social work services, are needed to ensure that seniors get access to benefits, hot meals, and can work to combat social isolation we need to ensure that federally funded benefits such as Social Security, SSI, Medicare, Medicaid are protected and possibly expanded. In December 2018, the organization Justice in Aging issued a special report entitled Older Women in Poverty. This report not only examined the causes of why a significant number of older women live in poverty, but also offered a set of recommendations to help alleviate their plight. In addition to shoring up and expanding many of the traditional social safety net programs, Justice in Aging also recommended that the expansion of free legal services should be an integral part of this equation. Access to free attorneys can combat homelessness through eviction and foreclosure prevention. It could combat the financial exploitation of seniors by predatory lenders. It could prevent elders from elderly abuse and discrimination, and it can ensure that seniors are empowered to take control of their lives and their decision making. Recently, we were approached by the daughter of a 93-year-old woman who was facing eviction from her Harlem home, where she had lived for decades. Suffering from dementia, her mother had failed to file uh, her recertifications for her Section 8 benefits, uh, and those Section 8 benefits were needed to afford her apartment. Fortunately, the year before, Volunteers of Legal Services Elderly Project had met with the mother and prepared and executed a power of attorney authorizing her daughter to manage her affairs should she ever become incapacitated. 
She had done so at the urging of a case manager at the visiting nurse service, a volunteer's a VALS community partner whose staff recognized early onset of dementia in the client. Using that power of attorney, we were able to retroactively restore the client's Section 8 housing subsidy, ensure that the benefits would not be terminated in the future by obtaining a reasonable accommodation from the agency, to mail all future notices to her daughter, and this has allowed her to remain in her home and stay close to her daughter who lives in the building next door. This is a story about how access to counsel for a matter as simple as getting a power of attorney done for an elderly woman prevented an eviction, prevented placement in a nursing home, prevented a guardianship proceeding, and saved the city thousands in public funds, and most importantly, saved the family from suffering. Thank you again for giving us the opportunity to testify. Volunteers of Legal Service looks forward to working with the city council and the administration to ensure that New York City is best able to support our seniors in need. Thank you. Hi, Kate, welcome back. Hi, <laughs> sorry, a protest on the steps for our other park. <laughs> um, uh, hello, I would like to thank the council members uh, and um, I love people who do advocacy for older women. Um, so I, I'm gonna just try to do statistics today on Alzheimer's disease and its impacts on aging, poverty, and being female. I'm not an expert, I just um, am from Neighbors to Save Rivington House, so sort of fell into this. Um, plus, I took care of my mother. Um, uh, I just wanna say that we have no national policy to address the public health crisis of Alzheimer's disease. No well-regulated nursing homes to house our elders when it becomes necessary to have long-term 24-7 skilled care. It takes a toll on caregivers and those with the disease alike as it drives older women deeper into poverty. Um, I think, you know, as much as possible, we try to keep people in their homes, but if you've ever cared for somebody with Alzheimer's dementia, there comes a point when you really can't. Um, so, um, the, I think the poverty issue has been covered, so I'll just try to talk about the statistics on women. Uh, women are two-thirds of the population afflicted with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. 64, 65% uh, plus of those caring for someone with uh, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias are women. 65, uh, over 65% of those with AD&D &D, uh, with uh, unpaid care from a family member or friend are women. A third of uh, Alzheimer's disease caregivers also have a minor child at home. Uh, caregivers are almost all women, I'm sure you know. Um, uh, Ian Poo has said care is women's work, women's work, voluntary or unpaid and systematically devalued. Most care workers here are women, disproportionately women of color, migrant women, or women marginalized uh, social status. The work is often part-time and inconsistent inconsistent, uh, long-standing racial exclusions from labor protections and uh, um, uh, shortages have, uh, and culture that have failed to adequately uh, value uh, or support caregiving have resulted in high turnover rates, worker shortages, and thus lower quality care. The median annual pay for home care jobs is $13,000, barely above the federal poverty level. As a result, more than half of U.S. care workers rely on some form of public assistance. I'll just do other statistics. Um, senior housing, uh, let's see, 42% of adults caring for aging relatives, 52 million caring for others on top of jobs and childcare, a systematic problem that can't be solved individually. People with Alzheimer's disease and dementia tend to be especially vulnerable to abuse because the disease makes, uh, may prevent them from reporting the abuse or recognizing it. Abuse can occur, occur anywhere, including at home and in care settings, and can take many forms. The lack of affordable, accessible housing integrated with long-term care can leave some older adults homeless or at risk of homelessness. The long duration of the illness before death contributes significantly to the public health impact of Alzheimer's disease because much of the time is spent in a state of disability and dependence. Even with help from community-based services, respite services, providing care for a loved one with Alzheimer's or other dementia becomes more difficult with time. In later stages of the disease, many people will require more care and assistance than their family members and those services can provide. Um, to, the typical homeowner would have enough wealth to pay for three and a half years of a nursing home stay. 
uh, in that type of residential facility would exhaust the wealth of a typical renter age 65 and over in a matter of weeks. Dementia imposed a financial cost of approximately $28,500 per affected person per year, not counting the economic cost of informal care. Uh, the average cost for a private room in a nursing home is $97 plus thousand dollars. The average for semi-private is 85, almost 86,000 a year. Most families care, pay for residential care costs out of their own pockets. Some facilities will accept Medicaid, others may not. Uh, the average caregiver over 50 who leaves the workforce to care for a parent loses 303, uh, almost $304,000 in lifetime wages, social security, and private pensions kicking the cost down the line and making the economy as a whole less productive. Uh, tell me when that buzzer goes off. Um, older African Americans are about two times and older Hispanics are about one and a half times more likely than older whites to have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, limited data exists about the prevalence of it in other racial and ethnic groups including Asian Americans and Native Americans. Non-Hispanic blacks had significantly higher costs of care than whites or Hispanics, primarily due to more inpatient care uh, and greater severity of the illness. Half of uh, a a um, Alzheimer's caregivers are between the ages of 45, and I might have already said that. Uh, people with dementia report being afraid of the reactions of others and lower perceived status within society because of the diagnosis. There's a tremendous stigma with Alzheimer's. Uh, that's probably good. I have a million of them. <laughs> anyway, I, I do want to say that the, the one um, thing that hasn't been talked about quite for me enough is that um, is the, the aspect of this, uh, of aging where uh, disability hits and um, where at some point somebody may need uh, the 24-7 skilled care. And in our community, as the council member well knows, and we have fought with her for a long time, to um, have uh, Rivington House return to the community. We don't have any care facilities except one with very small numbers, um, not even Gouverneur, uh, actually can handle Alzheimer's patients. So we're in desperate need and we have an epidemic coming. So thank you. Thank you, Kate, and thank you for, for sharing. I know that you know this is a, a critical issue and uh, hopefully that with this committee and with the council, we're gonna continue uh, to advocate for our older adults. And thank you for the great work that your organization does, Peter. Um, we know that legal services is important and that's why the council also have you know, passed legislation to make sure that tenants who are getting evicted have legal representation and we wanna make sure, especially older adults um, that are facing that situation have legal representations. Thank you, Council Member. And I would just like to say that, uh, as was pointed out earlier, yes, right to counsel ha is for everyone, but I think we need to also have special programs for our seniors that focus on their particular needs, uh, particularly their legal needs with respect to life planning. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to make sure that that critical piece is heard as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, being here today. Anyone else uh, wanted to testify? If not, then uh, this hearing is adjourned.